Safety first. As per the last census, the Indian workforce is over 400 million strong. By 2024, that number could very well cross 600 million, a 39.1% of the total Indian population. Over 42% work in heavy industries, use heavy machines, cope industrial hazards. A 17% of India's GDP comes from manufacturing industries. Safety is the first aid of the uninjured. Safety tops all the priorities in the industrial sector. Worldwide, we have 340 million occupational accidents and 160 million victims of work-related illnesses annually. 6,000 die every day. Safety is a challenge. Be it any industry, organization, or an employee, everyone needs to be safe. Humans do, machines do. Industrial safety parameters are getting complex with each passing day. Elimination of industrial hazards is a dire necessity. Prevention of work-related injury is a prerequisite. Ask Abhinav Dar, a manager from one of the Fortune 100 companies who lost his employee to a fatal industrial accident. His workers lost morale. His company lost productivity by 20%. Questions stare right into our eyes. How to be safe? What is the solution? Who can keep us safe? Well, maybe God can, but we try to. We provide solutions. We help keep the industry safe and give you round-the-clock visibility of your assets. Maybe God can, but we try to. We provide solutions. We help keep the industry safe and give you round-the-clock visibility of your assets. We are the Hack Lab Solutions. We follow a 360-degree approach, considering all the three dimensions of safety implementation management, machines, and workers. With advancement of AI, next-gen automation is all about machines and humans coexisting, each taking care of the other. Our aim, hence, is safety for productivity. We use IoT hardware integration with sharp AI edge processing, real-time environment monitoring, data insights, and worker safety profiling. We estimate risk, employ professionals, analyze scenarios, and provide solutions. Our systems can predict failures, warn you, and take action. Our suite of tracker products cater to major Fortune 500 companies and in several industrial sectors ranging from FMCG, logistics, mining to metals, and manufacturing. Our safety product verticals include collision avoidance system, pedestrian alert system, AI-based compliance monitoring, safety interlocks, and smart traffic management system. Our security product verticals include tracker tags, smart tracker cam, tracker PA system. We have been recognized as the best Indian startup in the automation domain by Technovation Awards conducted by India Electronics and Semiconductor Association, IESA. We won the award for the best company in innovation showcase category by SIC IT Kanpur. We have gained trust of clients like Unilever, ITC, Pendelco Industries, and top Fortune 500 companies availing our products and services. Today, we dive into a crucial topic that affects everyone. The journey India has taken towards enhancing safety across industries, workplaces, and public spaces. From regulatory reforms to technological advancement, India has made significant strides in building a safer environment. But what progress has truly been made and what challenges remain? Join us as we analyze India's evolving safety landscape with insights from experts in the field. Today, we are joined by Mr. Nigel, who is a corporate EHS head at LNT, and Mr. Vikram Rastogi, who is the founder of Hacklab Solution. Let's get started. 
I would like to start with you, Mr. Nigel. Could you please introduce yourself for our audience today? Yes, good evening, and thank you very much, first of all, for uh, inviting me to, to come to this podcast. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to share my experiences with you. Yes, my background, I'm, I've been here in India now for almost 11 years working with LNT. So I've been with the same company for last years. But I started my career not in safety. I actually started my career in the military. Um, and I served in the British Army for 15 years, having joined as a junior leader in the infantry at the age of 16. So I served 15 years. And then afterwards, I moved into um, construction, in particular railway construction. And I worked there for another 20 years in, in, in uh, railway construction. And then I saw some opportunity to come to India. I originally came to India just for a couple of years to work on a project. And almost 11 years later, I'm still here. So there must be something about living in India that I must like. So I'll tell you more about this later. Thank you, Mr. Nigel. It's great to learn from you that you love India. You are, you fell in love with India. So that's great. Very much. Nice. Vikram, would you like to share about yourself and Hack Lab Solutions? Uh, yeah, thank you, Amber. Hack Lab basically started as a safety automation company. We started with the aim of bringing technology into safety and building products to ensure that we can save lives with the help of technology. So currently, we are building a lot of solutions which use IoT and AI to enable not just the people who are not on the site, but people on the site also to be safe. So our goal has been like whatever solutions we are providing, they are not just a monitoring solution. They basically ensure that the person on the ground is safe by using our technology. For example, if we are putting our technology on cameras to detect some violation, we want to make sure that the person on the ground who is committing the violation is also aware of it. So rather than just doing a post incident analysis on uh, using our software, we do a real time checking of what exactly is going on the ground and then make sure that the person who is committing the error can gets a chance to correct it. So that has been what the technology that we have been working on. We want to prevent accidents, prevent any kind of incidents from happening. So that has been the goal. And that is what we have been doing. And we have been uh, fortunate enough to be working with top companies. And maybe uh, we can continue this discussion uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, for sharing about Hack Lab Solutions. So uh, for this podcast, I will start with the first question and then we can open up for discussion. Mr. Nigel, if I would ask you, how would you summarize the overall safety progress that India has made in recent years, particularly in industrial and workplace settings? Yes, it's a very good question. And first of all, having come from the UK, coming from a, a different environment, my, my story was that I was working in a highly regulated environment in the UK, and I was working on UK railways, which is more regulated than most other industries within the UK. And what happened was I was, I was given the opportunity to be the head of one of the largest projects in India at that time for the construction of the dedicated freight corridor in Rajasthan. This was a, a 640 kilometer railway where we were doing the construction work and we were the principal contractor on that particular project. So at the time, I was seeing projects, many projects in the UK. Those projects were pretty much, how can I say, as I say, highly regulated and to, to a large extent safe. So when I was given the opportunity to come to India, I knew that this would be a massive challenge in terms of safety. And that was one of the reasons why I actually came to India to, to deal with this particular challenge. And not just because of safety, but also because of the scope of the kinds of projects that, that India is undertaking. So this was a, a big opportunity for me. My first impression, if you watch YouTube or you watch the news or, or TV, you'll see that there was a, a big difference between different countries. So safety was something that was very different compared to where I was from. Uh, and this is entirely what I expected. So to come to construction sites and to see something that was very different was something that wasn't entirely expected to me. One of the first things that I adopted when I came to India was an attitude where um, things are not necessarily good and bad. They are simply different and things change. 
So if I look at the journey that, that we made in the UK, it's the same journey that's happening in every other country. So I was not unduly surprised to, to come to a construction site and see some of the behaviors or some of the uh, conditions that were on the construction sites that were very different. And on that perspective, we knew that there was some work. And there's some aspects of it which are, are really quite surprising. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if you imagine a, a worker who is not wearing safety shoes, you, you would imagine that worker to have lots of injuries as a result of not wearing safety shoes. In actual fact, one of the heartening things that I found was that actually there was less injuries as a result of, of wearing safety shoes because people are very careful when they're walking around the construction site without safety shoes. And that was something that was surprising to me to find that actually Indian workers are significantly more careful with regards to the way that they look after themselves when you consider the types of hazards that exist on those sites. So that was something that was a little bit heartening in that respect. But in terms of compliance, I was really surprised to, to come to LMT to find that actually a lot of the systems and processes that we were driving in the UK were exactly the same as were being driven in India also. So the, the methodology and the types of engineering works that we were doing was pretty much the same. The actual deliver of it was different in many respects. And, and that was highly to be expected because you're working in a different environment with different resources and so on. So for example, if you consider the budget that we would spend on PPE in, in Europe is very different to the budget you would spend in India. So there's a big difference there. So you have to make adjustments for that and, and work to that. So culturally, the, yes, the, there was a big difference between the two. Um, but fundamentally, you're, you are doing construction work and you are using big machines, the same machines that we're using in other countries. So there should be not much difference in that respect. And so in that respect, in, in terms of seeing the differences between my organization and if you look across the fence to another organization, again, big differences. So you've got the organized sector where the work is being done in a completely different way to what is being done in your organized sector. And what I would say about that is that over the years, what I found was that systems we had in place were being copied by our competitors, were being copied by other organizations. And what became uh, evident, but so as a, a good example, is that if you imagine on every LNT construction site for the last 15 or 20 years, we issue yellow helmets to workers, we issue a vest and we issue safety shoes. Um, and what you find in construction sites all over India is that the construction workers are all issued with yellow helmets. And the standard that we have set is the same that is now being driven in both the organized and the unorganized sectors also. So this is something that is really fantastic to see that the big um, corporate organizations are actually driving the, the safety in, in, in the less organized sectors also. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. So uh, one uh, question I have here, you came from Europe, right? So there is a, a huge regulation uh, that is already in place there. So people are trained to follow the rules. Do you see problems uh, with respect to training people in India with respect to following the rules and regulations, SOP? Yeah, okay. If you have, if you go back in history um, into the UK, we started the Industrial Revolution. We started the um, Health and Safety at Work Act in 1974. So we were at the very forefront of, of regulation in that respect. Right. And the reason for that was because we had many thousands of accidents where people were losing their lives and being injured. This was the norm in England. And a lot of people would say that these were occupational hazards. That was the mentality back in the 1950s and 1960s. And by the 1970s, it became unacceptable. The only difference I would say is that India was just a few years behind the UK in terms of, of driving, in terms of introducing the legislation, and, and they're still a few years behind now. But what I would say is that the, the, the requirements in terms of delivery, the challenges were the same. So for example, when I started in the construction industry, we didn't have a, man, a mandatory to wear a helmet. We didn't have mandatory to wear 
some of the PPE that is now mandatory in India. And okay. so we started off with a situation where we told the workers to carry the helmet. And then we found that the workers were refusing to, to carry the helmets. And they, we had to, to bully the workers to, to carry. In, in the end, it was easier to just say it's mandatory to wear it all the time. Yeah. And it was the same with the safety vest and other things. So this challenge of forcing people to wear PPE was it has been the same is there's, there's, there's no difference at all in the uk and india the only difference is that because you've got a much smaller workforce a much smaller pool of people to do it's actually easier to control in that respect whereas right. here in india it's a much larger workforce and, and when i look at india i don't look at india as a comparison to uk i have to make a comparison to the whole of europe because the in fact in india you've got double the people that exist in the whole of Europe. So it, it, you're not comparing like fossil, that's the big important thing. So the challenges were actually the same. And th the difference here is it's on a much larger scale. Everything is on a much larger mm -hmm. scale. So that's the challenging aspect of it. But in terms of the legal requirements, what I can say is that the legal requirements is, is literally a copy and paste. And it's a copy and paste from most legislations across the world. It's the same, you are not allowed to harm your workers. That's the, the fundamental aspect of it. Right. The how you interpret uh, those those requirements is is the same. You you, know, you must have um, risk assessment and put systems in place to prevent people from being harmed. So that's the same. So that there are other cultural aspects that, that are that are more challenging, but we we have to address those. But fundamentally, with regards to the legal requirements, what I would say is that here in India, you are updating on a regular basis. Recently, you updated the occupational safety and health and working conditions. This was in 2020. So that's a, another big boost in terms of requirements. And right. one of the things with those that legislation is it, it started to make more demands in terms of penalties, in terms of enforcement. And, and if you look at a fundamental difference between India and other countries, is that the enforcement of the regulation is not quite as demanding in India as it's as it is in other countries. So that's something that will evolve. Um, certainly when I'm giving training, if I gave some training this morning to some of our staff this morning, and one of the things I was saying to our staff was that whatever the conditions we have today here will change. It will evolve in the next few years. So if you are committing a safety crime, you will be prosecuted in the future. Whereas Right now, there's, there's a chance that you may well get away with it. And that is going to change. And that's the same, not just for the individuals, it's also for the corporates also. And, and corporate organizations will be in the firing line because what we experienced in the UK was that the smaller companies were not being prosecuted in quite the same way as the larger companies. So the larger companies across the country will get the really heavy penalties because it, they use those big companies that with the big profits to to demonstrate to the smaller companies of what the expectations are, and that's that that happened in my company. We, we I used to work for a company called Babcock International, which is one of the largest companies in the UK, and we suffered as a result of that, receiving very heavy penalties for for even minor injuries. So that was a learning example for us. So we're going to go through this here. Yes. 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 Uh, so I want to move our discussion a little bit towards the technology. Uh, technology is evolving rapidly. So uh, Mr. Nigel, how has technology, including AI and IoT, contributed to advancing safety in sectors such as manufacturing, construction, and transportation? I can give you my, my, my feedback on my organization. And I worked on two projects. Uh, my first project was, uh, as I mentioned, was the, uh, the dedicated freight corridor. We, we constructed a 640 kilometer railway. Um, we were the first project to, to use the track lane machines, automatic track lane machines for this. And we introduced a lot of technology onto that project. My second project was the high-speed railway. And this project was the largest EPC contract in India at that time. We started it in, in December, 2020. This is a 25,000 crore project. So. There was a lot of demands from the Prime Minister's office to demonstrate that we're using technology and making sure that we're at the forefront of innovation and so on. So we were, from the word go, very keen to make sure that we put everything in place. So we, in fact, we brought in some corporate 
uh, digital people to work with us to make sure that we could start implementing. So as an example, we were using drones to monitor the, the, the project. Uh, this was very effective. So we could, as I say, it was a 237-kilometer project where we're, doing, we're constructing a 237-kilometer viaduct. So this is a huge undertaking. So the drones were there to, to monitor progress. We could also use them to, to check on the, the work sites themselves. But if you looked at the construction itself, we were using auto-launching equipment to construct 970 metric ton girders. These are the largest girders ever constructed in India. So effectively, you're constructing a, a 40 to 45 meter bridge span and launching it as one uh, item. So this was stuff that you, you see on YouTube. It's, it's the sort of thing that people get really excited about. And we were delivering this. So we were manufacturing uh, this stuff in our casting yards. Our casting yard, one of the casting yards was the, the largest ever in India. It's absolutely huge. And the technology inside the, the casting yard in terms of lifting, moving this equipment around was, was uh, tremendous. Some of it we, we purchased from abroad and a lot of the, this machinery, we manufactured it ourselves. And so l &T has got a big manufacturing base. We, we could manufacture ourselves and we could design it to our own spe specification as well. So this was really innovative, moving. And, and when we started the project, none of the staff who were involved in it. None of our engineers had ever done this work before. We'd never done this before. We had to learn on day one. We had to sit around the table and work out how to use this equipment and set up all the technical checklists and all these sort of things. So that was an interesting for us. Uh, and it proved to be extremely successful in terms of using really fantastic equipment, really sort of state of the art. So in addition to that, we, we were using sort of other equipment as well. So for example, we were using CCTV on all our construction sites. All of our CCTVs are linked, so we can now monitor the, the construction sites from remotely from the office. We can remote it anywhere in the country. In my office here, uh, we have what we call the war room. Um, I, I'm responsible for about 50 projects here across India now. And we, we sit here and we monitor the, the casting yards and the, and the construction sites sitting in our office here and we produce reports and we check on those. In addition to that, we have some um, factory environments where we've started to use AI systems. Um, the AI systems are attached to the cameras and these are really great because what happens is the AI camera will spot workers who are not wearing their PPE, they'll identify things like when, when vehicles are traveling too quickly and so on. And what happens is an alert gets sent to the manager immediately to say that there's some issue that needs to be resolved. So we've got real-time information that we can use to prevent accidents from happening. So these are really great. And then when it comes to things like training, we use virtual reality systems, the, you know, these headsets that we have. And we have a number of modules. I think we have 16 modules that we use for that. For example, if you want to train firefighting, you can do this while the boys are having a tea break. Put the vr equipment on and they can have a play with this and then they can practice doing that putting fires out or they can do working at heights and, and other things like this so this is really useful technology that we're using as well so we're looking for new what, what is the new technology for doing that the safety teams that we have on our sites they're all using apps we, we use um, apps to do so in the olden days when i first started with lnt we used to um, use checklists so there was lots of paper being used to manage the checklist for checking equipment, checking the sites and these sort of things. Um, we now do this using mobile phones. Everyone has, a, has a, a smartphone. We use an app on the, on the system. So any observations they can raise, uh, we can take photographs and all the information is now managed in, in real time. It means that um, when we're producing our reports, we've got real data that we can use to, to do analysis to establish what is the big areas of concern that we have to deal with and this is really useful for us so this means that the, the continuous improvement process is, is ongoing and so we're looking at other things looking what else is, is, is around the corner what can we improve how can we slim down how can we reduce the effort that is being done that we were doing previously even if you look at some of our casting yards we're now looking to use robots to to do some of the work for us and that's something that we are now trialing if we've got some particularly hazardous activities let's get the robots to do those those hazard activities and so that's early stages that we're, and we're looking at those hopefully within the next sort of few years we can get that that as well um and, and that's particularly because on some of our construction sites we have thousands of workers that, that work on our sites 
And as India is becoming more industrialized, it's becoming harder to get workers, <laughs> believe it or not. And so we have to find another way of, of doing this work. So we have to find machinery equipment that can do the, the same job that workers were doing previously. So that, again, that's something we look at. But as a company, our chairman, uh, Mr. SNS, he's known as SNS, he's very much of a digital mindset and he is really pushing us to, to find any kind of innovation to, to speed up the work, improve the safety, improve the productivity and, and also the quality. Would you uh, like to uh, share some of your findings? Because I know you talk to industry leaders and also companies. So your perspective of how technology is revolutionizing the uh, safety sector in India. So what I can see is as we are growing as a manufacturing and a in more industrialized society, as Nigel sir has also shared, uh, it makes more sense for people to start uh, using technology for doing a lot of uh, monitoring and uh, uh, managing the safety aspect, right? You cannot do, uh, as we become more and more industrialized, as the work improves, the you cannot manage everything using tape man, pen and pen and paper, right? So it becomes more complex to do it uh, using manual processes. So you have to bring in technology and there has been a lot of initiative taken by not just the topmost companies, but also people who are in SME sectors who are in smaller factories, smaller companies, they are also taking a lot of initiatives because they want to make sure that to bring in cost efficiencies, technology is one of the major play that uh, can help them compete with. And as we become more and more global, globalized, it's not just India that we are competing with, right? So we have to compete with China. We have to compete with manufacturing sectors or pe uh, like sectors outside India also. So people are to become global and to get the cost advantage, they are bringing in technology in almost all aspects of uh, the pr production. So not just in safety, but also in productivity and quality management. So that has been the change that I am seeing over last five, six years. It has accelerated a lot, especially after the boom in AI. People are uh, utilizing AI in all sort of ways, documentation, to even like managing the cameras and all right so a lot of things which uh, earlier we you had to rely on the manual oversight so that is now changing and that is that, that is a trend i see that is going to continue over the next uh, few years as well sure, sure sure mr nizer i was thinking that have you come across any specific accident or any situation which was hazardous in your span while working in India and if you would like to share it with our audience. Uh, I think with working in, in India for more than 10 years, I it would be, it, be very wrong for me to say that I hadn't. Yes, we have come across accidents. And the thing that's really worth mentioning is that 99.9% .9 of all accidents that are happening are avoidable. And, and when you conduct a, an investigation and do the root cause analysis of the accident, you very often identify the fact that the accident has either happened, it's something that's reoccurred, maybe even many times. So this is a, a concerning thing for us, the fact that very often we don't learn from the mistakes that we've made previously. So this is why it's important to make sure that we deliver the proper training, we make sure that there's Hazard, hazard awareness and, and that we as an organization have the organizational learning of what's happened previously so we don't repeat it. What we find in India particularly concerning is that there is a is a distrust to, to report accidents. That's a big concern because people really don't want to admit to making a mistake. People do not want to share the, 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 the problems that have occurred on their sites or, or even the sort of the, the, the things that have gone wrong. So that becomes challenging because all the opportunities for learning that you could have had with a near miss or with a minor accident are very often lost and you end up with a very serious accident that could have been avoided if you'd learned the mistakes much earlier. And that, that's something that's a big concern for me. So yes, we do have accidents. We have too many accidents. We have within our organization what we call Mission Zero Harm. And, and our objective is to have zero accidents, nothing at all. There is no lower limit. Or it, the, the limit is zero. And so therefore, every time there is an accident, then we have to really inwardly 
look and see, you know, come on, what have we done? Yes, we have to have the process in place. Some of it, if you look at the accidents that we have, is it a cultural problem? Is it a... And what I can tell you is that when you work in India, you're working with the majority of the workers that we have on our construction sites are transient workers, they are migrant workers. And so they're, therefore, the skill level is often quite low. And, and because they're migrant workers, they tend to remain on your construction sites for a relatively short space of time. So this means that the level of skill, knowledge, awareness never goes beyond the point. It, it, it goes, so whatever someone learns in four or six months is as far as we get. So you're not getting years and years of experience of your particular site. What we are seeing now, and this is something that's quite good, is the fact that we're now able to track workers who've worked for us previously. Uh, previously, we weren't really be able to track who the workers were because names are, are given, but there's no um, ID system previously. So now we use the ADAR card as a system to identify. So we can now give tasks to workers that we know that have worked in different tasks on, on the same tasks on our projects previously. That's something that's really good. And we can also see where they've also worked. So very often, if it's a transient worker, they'll work for LNT in different parts of the country on different types of projects. We're now able to track that far better now than we, we ever used to. So we have a like a, a company-wide database to be able to manage that. So that's a really good way of managing that. But dealing with accidents, what you have is you have this, as I say, this transition from people working in the, the, the uncontrolled sector to coming into the controlled sector. This means that you effectively, when you put a uniform on, on, on your workers, you have thousands of workers on your site. They're all wearing yellow helmets. They're all wearing a yellow vest. They're all wearing safety shoes. Everyone looks the same. And, and what you don't know is who the people are who, who've got little or no experience. So we've introduced an orange helmet on, on our sites now. So workers who have got, who are new to our sites, who we've not seen before, uh, we give them an orange helmet. They, they wear those helmets for a few months. And then, so we, we make sure that those people are not engaged in high risk activities. They, they only do the sort of the, the lesser tasks until we get to know them and we can trust them and then we can put them into to more hazardous environments. So that's the way of controlling that. But then go back to your question with regards to accidents. How do we reduce it? That's the, the million dollar question that I'm asked on a daily basis. And you are forever uh, demanding the compliance. You're demanding compliance. And this is do not walk by campaigns. You, you have a system where you have rules and those rules have to be enforced. And you have to keep on pushing to get those rules enforced. And that's difficult in some locations. It's difficult with some parts of the country where there's different cultures and different uh, behavior sets that we have. We have to, to keep on driving. So in terms of education, we have to keep on educating the consequences of those. One of the concerns that I have, particularly with regards to accidents, is that if you look at the availability of medical resources, if you're working in remote locations, it can be the difference between life and death on some accidents. So if you are having first aid treatment, for example, you're having life-saving treatment. If you are in the city, you could be treated very quickly and, and there would be no problem. You, you'd have a relatively minor injury. What happens in, in some remote locations, a minor injury becomes very severe. So I'm, I'm quite concerned with this in terms of how we provide uh, medical support in terms of first aid, on our construction sites, if you have the, the staff who are trained in first aid on the sites, and then we have our own first aid ambulances and, and resources on our sites, we have our own doctors also, but they need to get to the site very quickly to deal with any mishaps, and then how we evacuate them to hospitals that are competent to deal with that particular type of, that particular type of injuries. So sometimes you do get a situation where minor injuries become quite severe, and that's something that we need to address as well. So having resources to be able to do that. The yeah, accidents are a big concern. That's why we're here, to prevent it from happening. Thank you, Nigel, for sharing that. Vikram, do you have any questions? Sir, do you have any stories of any major accident that you have covered in India or outside India? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about an accident that happened uh, a 
little while ago. We, as I mentioned to you, we use launching uh, equipment and we had a, one of these collapsed over a year ago on one of our projects and it, and it was a disaster. And on the one hand, what you have is on, on big projects, there's a real demand for collaboration between each of the different departments who are involved in running the project. So this goes right from the design. In fact, it goes from the client's requirements. Uh, what does the client want? What does the client expect in, the, in terms of contract? And then we go to the design. Then we go to, you know, if we're using plant and equipment, we have to manufacture this plant and equipment. It has to meet the specifications for the project. But if we are the organization who are inventing this equipment and we are the first people ever to use it, we have to anticipate what could potentially go wrong. And sometimes we can't because we don't have the experience ourselves to be able to do that. So a few years ago, we had, sorry, last year, we had an, a, a, a launching good that collapsed and it collapsed whilst we were transporting it. And what happened was that the center of gravity shifted and the whole thing collapsed. And somebody was, was killed as a result of that particular accident. And the only way we could describe that was that somebody was was killed but also was the fact that how do we remove this equipment because it's tons and tons of material it's stuck on top of a, a viaduct we have to remove it so that's even more hazardous to remove it and the cost of it and everything else was, was phenomenal we had to sit down really for a long time with all the different elements that were involved in the manufacturing the creation of this equipment and, and the operations of it and to see where we went wrong. So the investigation process is, is a very important process that we have in terms of review. At the same time, we've got the Labour Commissioner who's looking to, to, to prosecute us at the same time. And when you do have a fatality, you have to explain you know, that you have done something wrong and you then have to explain all the things that you did correct before the accident. When there is an accident, happens is that two things happen. We will do an investigation and that investigation will be to identify exactly what happened, what were the sequences that, that went wrong. We need to establish um, the root cause of this. We, we go through what we call a why, why, why process where we're looking at all the different aspects of it. And then we produce what we call a, a fishbone, uh, um, herringbone um, analysis so that we can then review this and identify what actions we're going to we're going to take to to resolve this that's the accident investigation itself but what we also do at the same time is we prepare our defense and the defense that we prepare is to establish everything that we should have done correctly whether we have done that or not so for example if you look at the documentation for the work that we do there must be a risk assessment, there must be a method statement, there must be a pre-start briefing, there must be a um, toolbox talk given in advance of the work, there must be trained, qualified people on our construction sites, there must be um, induction training, there must be, all these things have to be in place. Our emergency plan was in place, our traffic management plan was in place, the construction environmental management plan was in place. We then look at the effectiveness of the training to see whether the people who were involved in the activity were actually doing the work correctly. Did they use the correct uh, permit to work system, checklists, and so on. So there's a whole load of things that we check to see if, we, if we've done it correctly. And sometimes you'll do an investigation, you find that actually there was a few things that were not being done properly. Maybe the workers were not wearing PPE or maybe there was something that was not being followed that should have been. And then we can put that as part of the mix to, to be filled in. But we have to provide a defence. So very often, even if we're not prosecuted by the authorities, we, we have to do the in, inward wash up also to identify how we're going to correct those particular issues. So this is a big thing. What's particularly challenging is if you start getting involved with design problems because the designers they're sitting in the office, they're not hands-on in terms of seeing what's actually being delivered. If it's plant and machinery equipment, how do those people, again, you go back to your suppliers, we will go back to the suppliers and say, look, we've had a problem with this particular piece of equipment. How can you improve that equipment? How can you understand that we need to have some other technology attached to that? So for example, let's say, for example, an accident happens where someone was hit by some plant 
can we install proximity alarms or can we install some other system to make sure that workers are not going to go anywhere near that machinery whilst it's in operation. So there, there's a lot of thought has to go into that and we have to collaborate with, with people and we have to tease out the, the possible technologies that they've got that we could use in the future. So we do this. So as an example, if some if we have an accident with plant and machinery and someone has used the equipment when they shouldn't have done, we'll stick a, a biometric system so that they can't even enter the equipment unless they've got the, the correct thumb imprint so they so the so we do not have uncontrolled access to equipment and that's something that we will do we will put delay starter mechanisms so that if there's anybody sitting underneath it or near the machinery that an alarm will go off so people are aware that this machine is about to start in 20 seconds and, and so on so there's lots of technology that we would use but we need to tease that out and some sometimes we it takes an accident before we we actually learn that there's a problem that needs to be addressed so yeah, it's a big it's a big area. The biggest challenge with this is collaboration. And as I said to you, if people are, are afraid to be involved in the accident investigation, then you will continue to have the same accidents without having the innovation to resolve these things. So that's where we are. But yes, we, we do have accidents. And when you have an organization like ours, we have 50, 50 projects that we're running in the so we're working at, to give you an idea of what we're doing we, we're working in, we've got 17 projects metro projects in all over the country we have three projects that are high-speed railway projects we have a nuclear projects nuclear power stations we're constructing we're doing defense projects in terms of ports and harbors we're doing tunneling under most cities up in the the mountains of Uttarakhand and Jammu Kashmir we're doing tunneling works for the Heidel projects we're building dams so these are big projects, and, and so there's an awful lot of skill, knowledge, experience that we have to tease out. So as a safety guy, I know so much. I'm not an expert on absolutely everything. But what happens is that if you ask enough questions through the investigations, you soon become an expert because you ask the right questions, get the right answers, and then you can tease out. And, and what I find personally is that if you ask lots of stupid questions, eventually you get the question that, People say, ah, yes, there's, a, there's something that we've overlooked that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing which I loved about our conversation, like how open you are about the investigations that you did and what kind of processes you have set up after that. Because this is what I feel should be there in India. This is what I've seen in the West. There are reports that are coming out of OSHA and all the agencies where they are they investigate and they are very openly saying that okay these were the problems and these are the solutions that have now been implemented and i agree with you like these have to happen for change to happen even in india otherwise until this we open up the investigation we talk about it we will not learn from it and learning is very important from all these mistakes absolutely and, and if, if you make the same mistake twice it's, it's a crime. It really is a crime. So let's just get it right first time and let, and share the information with everybody and, and, and try not to try not to shame people. That's the, the big, in, the, there's a tendency. Of, 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 yes, mistakes can happen. There's, there's, mistakes are like part of human error, right? So humans can make mistakes, people can make, processes can be wrong. But we need to learn yes, from them. Yes. We need to improve it. Otherwise, we'll be stuck. We'll not go anywhere. I, I, I have a strong view on this, uh, and this is where you look at negligence. And as you say, someone can make a mistake due to lack of knowledge, lack of experience, or just simply having a bad day and they can make a mistake. But where I draw the line is where there's ig uh, willful um, ignorance or willful um, negligence, and, and people are deliberately not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and that's a completely different story. And that's where you start talking about professionalism and people being disciplined to do the job that they're paid to do and, and that's something that's a problem and we have to deal with that also so true absolutely yeah that was a really nice discussion so as we uh, move towards the closing uh, of our podcast i would like to take some uh, parting remarks first Nigel, you can share some parting remarks and something for the future Okay, so I, I've moved from a project-based uh, environment to a corporate role, and, and I'm now wearing a, a new hat, if you like. So I'm now looking at the, the bigger picture across everywhere. So I've done the evolution, if you like, from going from site 
I would consider myself to be a site person. I'm much more of a hands-on type of person rather than a corporate person. But what I am finding is that the hands-on experience is absolutely vital um, to engage on the construction sites and be on the construction sites. So one of the things that, that I have a, a big concern with, with India particularly, is that you have, I, I won't say the caste system as such, but there, there, is a, there is different levels of people within on our construction sites or, or, or where we work. So for example, if you look at the workers, for example, the workers are at one level and then the staff are, are a completely different level. And what we find in the UK that is very different is that the workers are educated to, to, to some extent in the UK, uh, but the gap between the workers and the staff is much, much smaller. And in some case, there's an overlap. Um, so what, what I would like to see going forwards is where we can educate our workers to be safety professionals and to trust them to, to run our sites in terms of you know, acting as a foreman or to act as, a, as more professional in, in terms of what they can do. So that's something that there is a gap. We, what we have is, is this worker class, which are, as I say, transient or, or migrant workers, but we're not using them in quite the way that we, should, we perhaps should do. And so that's bringing people up. <laughs> and to the other respect, we have to bring people down also. So, so our staff, the people who are educated, they need to be prepared to get their hands dirty. And that's something that we also need to make sure that we're all in it together. We're all there to get the, the work done also. And we need to have a lot more empathy with regards to each other's objectives and targets to, to achieve the, 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 the task that we're trying to do. So I think in that respect, there's some work to be done. Corporately, I'm looking at the systems, the processes that we have. I'm forever looking to reduce the amount of paperwork that we use to try and prevent having to read. Many of the documents that we produce are produced by the kilo rather than by the content. And this is always a problem. And, and so I'd rather have a, a much more simplified mechanism for understanding what we need to do. And that means that we have to spend more time delivering training, making sure that the training is interesting and it actually meets the, the requirements that we have rather than just training for the sake of training. I'm pretty much into evaluating what the training has been delivered. You know, is it actually meeting the requirements of what we're trying to achieve or not? So to say that you've done some, some training in some particular subject doesn't mean that you're free from having an accident. It still means that if the workers or the staff who are being trained are turned off by the trainer, that's a big problem. And so we have to improve our training cap capability. Challenging it is in India. You're trying to teach in English. You're trying to teach in Hindi. You're trying to teach in Telugu or in, in Tamil. So having to try and deal with this cultures of different languages and different backgrounds of people is tremendously challenging. We use a lot of videos. We make our own videos. We have a lot of safety videos that we use and we try to make them in as many languages as we possibly can so that it's understood by the people who are, who are going to, to things. And these things have to be entertaining. They have to be interesting enough for someone to sit for 20 minutes or even 45 minutes to actually watch the, the, the things and to actually learn from it. So again, we have to spend a huge amount of money to produce this, but the, the long run is that if you can save one life, then, then it's worth doing it. And, and LNT is certainly prepared to do that. But in the background, we have to put a lot of effort into writing the scripts and making sure that these things are there. When it comes to compliance, having a zero tolerance attitude towards um, safety, how do you drive that? How do you make sure that you are making sure that people on our construction sites are following the golden safety rules, making sure that every single process is being followed is, is demanding. And, and it requires people to be, to some extent, quite aggressive. They have to be very passionate about the saving lives. And so looking at the, the culture that we have, we can't walk by, we can't be in a position, and we have to be almost, is the word I think, in terms of your determination to, to drive safety. So how do you do that? How do you make your how do you make everyone else passionate? How do you make everybody else have his internet? And the way I see it is that if you go to a wedding and the, the music starts, maybe one person will get up and start dancing. And he's the crazy guy. No one will join the crazy guy. It's the second guy who gets up, you know? And once the second guy gets up and then everybody else will do it. 
Um, if you look at cultural change, it takes the crazy guy to, to go up first, and then it takes the second guy to, to follow. And I, I remember when I first came to India, I remember there was a cultural change that was happening in the UK where people using bicycles in the streets were starting to wear helmets in bicycle helmets. Now, there was no legal requirement to do. There was no, there's never been a law to say that you must wear a, a cycle helmet when you ride your bicycle. So, of course, when I came to India, there was no one had ever heard of a, a bicycle. Why would anybody wear a helmet while you're riding a bicycle? It's right. never required. Certainly when I was a child, no one wore a helmet. You fell off your bike and you, you hurt your head. That was the norm. What I'm seeing now, I'm in Chennai. And if you go down the you know, East Coast Road, you'll see cyclists every Sunday going down the road. Yeah. And they're all wearing helmets. And it's something that culturally, it's starting to change. You go to construction sites, you'll see... You know, even in the, the uncontrolled sector, the uh, people are wearing helmets and it, it's happening. People are doing this. Not everywhere, but what they will see is that they'll see people being professional and people will want to copy the, the professionals who are doing that. And, and I, I think people will feel pride in doing so. So going forwards, I have every confidence that this the journey that, that is going on with regards to safety in India is, is going in the right direction. I think it takes a little bit of time. I think there's maybe a little bit more push required from the government in terms of enforcing the laws. What I would like to see is more budget being provided by the clients to make sure that the companies, the contractors who are working on big projects have got the finances to be able to do that. And to give an example with this in the UK is that the client would make sure that the safety requirements are actually specified in the contract. So you are delivering as per what the contract is giving, rather than making a choice for the contractor to, to either save money or to spend the money. So as a company like LNT, we're very willing to spend the money, but if our competitors are not prepared to do the same, they're going to win the tenders and they are going to win the work from us without having the same standards as we have. And which gives us this temptation to, to maybe cut back on safety also. And that's something that has to be addressed. And I think legally that there should be a demand that the clients would, would actually include. So for example, if you have a requirement to use scaffolding, then it should be in the contract that you have to use scaffolding rather than having people hanging from ropes or some other system. So right. that's how I see it. There's improvements to be done from, um, obviously from the contractor side, but also on the, the client side to, to be driving that also, and also for the government who, who could also enforce it as well. So yeah, it's, it's a teamwork in fact. And if we can, to the success that's being given on our construction sites, if we can recognize that success, then fantastic, let's do that. You know, that's where I was saying. But yeah, there's a lot to do. Corporately on the construction sites, on the, in our factories and all the other places, there's a lot to be getting at. And if one of the one of the things I like is that if you want to see further, you stand on the shoulders of a giant. There are giants out there. You just have to just climb up and stand on their shoulders and you can see much, much further. So just copy the people who are doing well right. and you, you can do exactly what they're doing and do it better than they do. And I think this is something that India is, is very capable of doing. I think we've got a lot of opportunity to actually go beyond what's being done in Europe and US and Australia and other countries like that. I think there's a lot of opportunity for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nigel. From your parting remarks. So a lot to learn during this podcast, whatever uh, Mr. Nigel has said, it has definitely, I think, given us a lot of information and uh, that is something that is uh, definitely going to help us and also the listeners of this podcast. Apart from that, I am sure India is a very young country. There are a lot of things that we need to learn and we need to improve. And definitely a lot of things are going to change in the future. India is having a good IT like crowd. So people who are interested in developing technologies. And I think one of the better ways of solving this problem is, the, is to use the technology that we have. And, and I believe it is something that is going to change as we go along. A lot of changes are happening and definitely some of the big corporates and the government are one of the major drivers of this change. And I'm thankful for Mr. Nigel to show us how LNT is driving the change in this industry. So that is very good for us to know and hear about. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nigel, and thank you, Vikram, for giving us your time today and joining in this podcast. I hope our listeners will get to learn a lot from Mr. Nigel's experience, and we also learned a lot. And thank you. Uh, so uh, let's play our part in building a safer India as we move forward. Uh, until next time, stay safe and stay informed. Bye bye. Say Jai Suraksha. Jai Suraksha. Jai Suraksha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.